So just do what you can to make sure you're comfortable tonight, wherever you're, <clears throat> you're zooming in from, that you're in a position that feels good, feels supportive. And we'll just, I'll do a little guiding at the beginning and we'll sit together till about um, 10 after. And, um, and then I'll make some remarks about Sila and we'll have a bit of a discussion. So. And as we begin our practice tonight, let's start just by connecting with the goodness of our intention to be here together, to give support to each other, to get support <clears throat> from each other. And also just appreciate that you were able to show up tonight that so often in our lives we have <coughs> excuse me we have these very good intentions and life just gets in the way it's no one's fault life just gets in the way so whenever we're able to follow through on an intention to come together and practice that's really a moment just to appreciate appreciate that we were able to do that and to have a little bit of joy. And as we practice tonight, practicing being present with the body that we have, with the mind that we have, I would encourage you, if it's possible, to see if you can practice with a very relaxed and receptive awareness. That sometimes we have the tendency to turn our meditation into a task or a project something we need to accomplish, something that we judge ourselves about. And it's, it's simply a reflection of sort of the culture we're in, the water we swim in. But if we can let go of this striving and just allow ourselves to be with with how we are this evening, with this body, this mind, these emotions, these plans, and just see if we can relax back into the present moment and just have a, a receptive awareness. noting the arising and the passing away of sensations, of ideas, of thoughts, of just having a spacious and a sort of very hospitable attitude about this mind and body. And if it's particularly supportive, and for some people it is, you know, you may choose to anchor your attention to the breath 
or to another sensation. Trust yourself to discover what will really support a practice of kindly open awareness, of loving presence, So let's just support each other in this endeavor this evening to be with things as they are, to be present with the moment, and to be kind, kind to ourselves.
And because tomorrow is a holiday associated with gratitude, let's end this practice tonight with, um, with a meta practice that is all about gratitude. So I would invite you to imagine this boundless field of loving kindness. It can be infinite. And into this field, we invite ourselves, each other, and all those beings that we have some gratitude toward. And let your imaginations roam. There are obvious candidates like our teacher Shelley, all the teachers. our parents, our family members, people in our community. All the people who've contributed to whatever comfort and ease we experience. We can bring to mind people who are essential to our, to our functioning democracy, public health workers, librarians, all sorts of public servants. Engineers, builders, Our field of loving kindness is infinite. Historians, just let your mind really get big. All those to whom you feel some gratitude. May we all, all of us in this boundless field of loving kindness, may we all be well, safe, peaceful. May we all be free from the fear that comes from anger, the suffering that's caused by, by anger, by disillusion. By ill will. May we all find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. And may we all cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May we all live in peace and harmony with all beings. May we all, every one of us, be well, be safe, be peaceful. May we all be free from the suffering caused by fear, by anger, by ill will. And may we all find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another.
May we all cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May we all, every one of us, live in peace and harmony with all beings. So as Shelly usually does, let's take about a three minute bio and stretch uh, break and um, be back here at about 8.13. So let's do that. Shelly Graff um, usually offers these Wednesday night evenings and um, Shelly has been sort of using as the armature for these discussions, Bhikkhu Bodhi's book, The Noble Eightfold Path. And you can also find it as a PDF when you click on the, the part of the calendar that um, notes what, what this is. And what we've done um, is to talk about the first, um, the first section of the path, which is the wisdom part of the path, which is about wise understanding and wise intention. And we're now talking about the part of the path that is called sila, that is about um, morality. And Shelley's been talking about particularly what counts as skillful speech or wise speech. And the other parts of that are uh, wise or skillful action, um, and um, wise or skillful livelihood. But I thought what I would like to do tonight is to step back a little bit and um, in make some remarks about uh, the whole idea of sila, that's the Pali word for, um, for translated as um, morality, moral excellence, um, right thinking and action, virtue, it's, it's a word that encompasses a moral universe. <clears throat> and um, it's also in addition to characterizing this part of the Eightfold Path that is skillful speech, skillful action, and skillful livelihood, it's also considered um, one of the paramis, which are Buddhist virtues, or they're called perfections of the heart so that in, um, in sort of developing a, a refined, skillful mind, doing skillful actions, that we cultivate the paramis, these perfections of the heart. And one of them is, is sila, which is virtue or um, morality. And you know, as Shelley has, has said so often, all of the Buddhist teachings are rooted in understanding suffering and the causes of suffering so that we can eliminate suffering. So when we think about sort of the moral universe, what we're really thinking about is, you know, what, what is suffering? What are the causes of suffering? And how do we um, not contribute to the causes of, of, of suffering? So sila is all about non-harming, not harming ourselves and not harming others. And when we get to the section on um, sort of skillful action, we'll see that there are these, these precepts that some of you may be familiar with and they're kind of guidelines for training. So it's, uh, there's a precept about um, refraining from, um, from harming, especially from killing. Um, a precept about 
not stealing, or we might understand it as not taking anything that's not freely given. And that has you know, tremendous implications for how we live in a world that um, we try to be sustainable, live in a sustainable sort of way and live in a world that, um, that will be suitable for future generations. Um, there's a precept about not engaging in um, sexual misconduct. And we can think of that one as you know, harming ourselves or others through sexual activity or even sexual energies, how we use them. There's a precept about not speaking falsely, uh, which we can also understand as um, listening. That, that sort of the other part of not speaking falsely is, is thinking about um, are we working with speech in a way that we, we are not listening? And finally, the, the last precept of these five is not consuming anything that, uh, that clouds the mind. And um, Stephen Batchelor, the teacher and philosopher, uh, Stephen Batchelor talks about this as doing nothing that would lead to carelessness, not ingesting or consuming anything that would lead to carelessness. And it's, I love that word carelessness because it can be interpreted in two ways, not doing anything that would be sort of heedless or sloppy or you know, sort of um, not paying attention to the consequences but also not doing anything that's not imbued with a care, a care for ourselves and a care for others. So in the weeks to come, Shelley is going to be talking a lot more about that. So, but if we think about Sela, this idea about the moral universe, um, moral excellence, one of the ways it's sometimes talked about is living in harmony that Sila is all about living in harmony, which is um, a wonderful um, ideal. And it also has a bit of, of a shadow side. And Shelley talked about that. What happens when, for the sake of harmony, we collude in, um, in some sort of, 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 of harm? And Shelley's talk particularly about colluding in a kind of white supremacist point of view, in, in colluding in, um, in not acknowledging the sort of um, the sort of of um, discrimination and racism that we find so often um, in our, our world. When, when someone says something, for example, someone might say something that is very anti-immigrant and for the sake of, of harmony, we just don't say anything. Where you know, we could say, well, that's not my experience. You know, something as simple as as that, that, that indicates non-collusion. Um, but also, and I think this is always worth saying, that, this, that the idea of living in harmony in Buddhist communities especially is one way that, um, that we shrink from taking an appropriate stand. And you know that one of the things that often characterizes Buddhists in Buddhist communities is that um, many of us are really pretty conflict averse. That we love this because we can be quiet, we can sit on a cushion, um, we don't have to have to engage. And the way that I have found for me most fruitful in um, in exploring sila is really about living with integrity. And for me, that, um, that's a, a deeper value than living in harmony. That living in harmony is, is a really worthy 
um, ideal. And we should learn to be, you know, learn about nonviolent communication. We should learn all sorts of skills to live in harmony. But occasionally, living in harmony, which often um, means not standing up for what we believe, not saying what we what we're seeing, what we're, what our own experience is. And, and to me, that sort of collusion that, that Shelley talked about. And for me, this idea of, of living with integrity is the most important thing. It's living in alignment with my deepest values, my core values. And I think that that's, um, That's the the quest in some ways to to really get clear about what is um, what is really important to live with integrity. And there's um, a contemporary concept um, called um, moral injury that I have just found really fruitful in thinking about um, Sila. So moral injury is the damage done to one's conscience or moral compass when that person perpetrates, witnesses, or fails to prevent acts that transgress one's own moral beliefs, values, or ethical codes of conduct. I'll read that again. So. The definition is that moral injury is the damage done to one's conscience or moral compass when that person perpetrates, witnesses, or fails to prevent acts that transgress one's own moral beliefs, values, or ethical codes of conduct. And one of the places that we see this sort of the, the um, the kind of archetypal case is in instances of war where people may um, witness acts, for example, done by their, um, their comrades and they are unable to prevent them. I mean, one of the things about, about moral injury that you, know, you may be the perpetrator you may actually choose to do something that you know is not in alignment with your your conscience, with your moral compass. You may you may be a perpetrator and aware of it, but also you may just be a witness to something that is um, that is really against what you you believe in deeply, and you're wounded by that. It's an injury. It's damage. And when you um, fail to prevent acts that transgress your own um, moral beliefs, that also is um, is a cause of injury. And and sometimes it's um, people who um, turn away. They don't want to know something that they think if I look at this, it will just be too painful. I don't want to know about this. So. For example, we can think about instances of um, abuse where someone reports something like a child and you think, oh, you know, that that couldn't be possible. Uh, this child's parents are so they're wonderful people. This this couldn't be true. And you just sort of um, turn away from it. And then later, when it's discovered that actually this child was abused or harmed, you know, you feel that injury, um, you know, and I know that sometimes teachers who just aren't able to follow up on something and they later learn that something terrible has happened, you know, that they, there is this sense of, of moral injury. And some professions, um, you know, sort of um, open up the possibility of moral injury. Um, in you know, instances where people are mandated reporters and they don't 
they don't follow through with something. Um, you know, so moral injury to me, really, although it's a very contemporary um, concept, it really, for me, gets at sort of the heart of what we're talking about with Sila. It's about, um, you know, you could be the perpetrator, you could be the person who acts against your own, um, your own values. But often, you know, being the bystander, being the person who witnesses it, um, you know, you, you see um, a microaggression and you don't say anything. You know, that would be, and you're aware of it and you recognize it, that you should have said something. You know, and often we have this, I wish I'd said something, I just didn't know what to say. I mean, many of us have had that, that sort of, of um, experience. Or sometimes we, we don't intervene, um, we don't help someone, and we find out that later that, um, that that person, something terrible has happened to that person. And we recognize that I had a chance to help that person and I didn't do it. So I think this idea of, of moral injury is a really powerful um, articulation of what's involved in in Sila about this uh, understanding um, you know, sort of suffering and the causes of suffering, that moral injury is an enormous um, cause of, of suffering. And it's really important to be aware of that. Um, Joseph Goldstein, um, has talked about the idea. He said, this is a little counterintuitive. Intuitive. But in Buddhism, it's better to know than not to know. So I'm going to read, this is a, a long quote from uh, a book that he participated in called Creating a Life of Integrity, where he talks a lot about the, the paramis. And he says, it is better to do something that is unskillful, knowing that it is unskillful, than to do it not knowing. It's better to do something that is unskillful, knowing it's unskillful, than to do it not knowing. Sometimes we do things that we know are unwholesome for whatever reason or justification. And he's talking in this um, part of the book about the decision to kill termites in a house, okay, that, you know, one tries to do catch and release maybe with spiders and mice, but when you've got termites eating your house, um, there's no catch and release. So he talks about, um, you know, some making that decision to bring in um, an exterminator and kill, um, kill the termites. And he said, it's better to do it with the knowledge that it is unwholesome, even as we are doing it, than not to acknowledge that it is unwholesome. Because in the former case, at least there's a seed of wisdom in there. If it germinates into some future reflection, it opens up the possibility of some future restraint. Whereas if we don't know it's unwholesome, then there's never any motivation to even consider what we're doing. So this is a, a pretty challenging idea because, you know, so often um, we hear, you know, ignorance is bliss or that idea of, you know, not knowing, of turning away, of I don't want to see this, I don't want to know this. Um, it's too upsetting. Um, and, um, you know, Joseph's point here is that even when we do something that is unwholesome and we all do things that are unwholesome and sometimes we do things that are just clearly, clearly harmful to ourselves or to, um, to someone else that, you know, in the way we consume things, in the way that we might, um, you know, sort of, um, when we, when we weigh, you know, 
uh, our carbon footprint, for example. Um, and so we decide, okay, but I really am going to take that airplane trip because I've always wanted to go to this place and I'm going to do it even though I know I'm contributing to um, carbonization. So just, you know, that, that, that understanding that our, our actions are not without consequence, that our actions may have some harmful elements um, in them and that that's really, that's really important that we, we, we can hold that, that we can hold, it's, it's okay to take this trip and I know what I'm doing is contributing to, um, to the carbonization of the, uh, of the environment. And then, you know, as Joseph said, because when we realize that we're doing something unwholesome, we have that seed, we realize how uncomfortable it is. So we think about, you know, sort of what would be a wiser choice? How could we do this differently? Or what could we contribute to that would make this, that would mitigate this? So that it's, uh, it's that when we realize that all of our actions have consequences, not only for ourselves morally, but have consequences on, in the world, then we can, um, in the future, act more skillfully. We've planted that seed. And so it's this idea, and I think this is something that um, that we do try to, to work with. Not, I mean, we work with this in our mindfulness practice. We, we work with this in so many ways, that idea of really being able to be with the discomfort, be with the um, whether it's sometimes we're with physical discomfort, whether we're with sort of emotional discomfort, but the idea of the, and the dis discomfort in this case is the discomfort of knowing that we've participated in something that is less than wholesome, that is unskillful, that we witness something, the whole idea about, about sort of the, um, the moral injury. When we can be with that, and be with it in, in a way that is infused with wisdom rather than with guilt or with shutting down, but really curious about how could we avoid this kind of suffering? How could we do something differently in the future? Um, you know, there are, are many stories, although I can't think of any one in particular right now, where someone, you know, has an experience and as a result of that, you know, sets up an organization, does something else that because of some really uncomfortable experience um, is motivated to, uh, to change their life in some way and do something that really addresses that. Um, and so I just offer this to you tonight as um, sort of a, a way of uh, of holding this idea of, of sila or moral excellence, um, the idea that we um, we're committed to non-harming. I mean, that's our that's what we aspire to. That we don't harm ourselves. That we don't harm others. That we don't add to the suffering. But the um, the interesting part of that for me is that it also really um, requires in some ways our ability to straightforwardly see where that discom discomfort is, where that injury is, where that unskillfulness is, and hold it in in a way that ultimately is going to contribute to um, to more skillful action, more humane action on, on our part. And a lot of this is about really developing that capacity to, um, to be with the discomfort of our own um, moral imperfection in 
in a way that is is really humane of seeing it for what oh oh this is this is moral injury when i didn't when i didn't say i saw that i didn't do anything i feel really bad that i didn't do anything that i didn't um didn't act didn't say anything um and to, and to realize that to, to realize to get the taste of that and to recognize it and to then resolve to um to be more skillful in the future because i think um you know when we really taste the residue of our unskillful behavior when we can really be and and, and really be with that um, the possibility of being more skillful in the future arises so it's not about shaming i think shaming is you know shaming this is an extreme statement but you know shaming never does anyone any good ever um, you know it's not about shaming it's not about guilting but it's about being an adult and being able to really um, look with with compassion on our own um, moral moral failings, our own unskillfulness, with the uh, with the encouragement that we can become more skillful, but to really be brave enough to see that um, to see that clearly, and as Joseph said. You know, it be if we're willing to see that, if we're willing to understand, acknowledge our own unskillfulness, to see it while even while we're doing it, to see this is this is not the most skillful thing, but this is what I'm going to do anyway. And sometimes, you know, like like the termites, I mean, you know, there's there's no right now, there's no good solution. Maybe in the future, someone will. Uh, who's had such a miserable experience, feels so bad about killing all the termites, comes up with some sort of thing that you can put on your house that would keep termites ever from, from chewing into it. Who knows? But it's, um, you know, that there's, we, we take this seriously, we take moral injury seriously. We recognize it because we realize that in that are the seeds to, um, to wiser and more skillful action in the future. So that's what I'd like to offer tonight. And I would be really interested in any um, responses that you have. I mean, if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy for them too, but I would really be interested in, um, in your response to, um, to these ideas. So feel free to just unmute yourself and chime in. Yeah, thank you for that idea um, of moral injury and that idea of witnessing is also a moral harm or moral self-harm um, because I was, I've been sitting with that this week with um, two new mass shootings um, in our country and, uh, you know, feeling the helplessness of that and then also feeling the weight of my own inaction around it. Um, so it was, yeah, it's a timely reflection. And, um, you know, my, I, could, I could feel my aversion to the news story. Like, I can't hear another, you know, I can't hear another. I can't hear another. I can't hear how many are harmed and how many are dead. And I can't hear it again. You know, and it was, it was in some ways self-protective um, and I honor that part of it, but in other ways, it's because I know that I am at this threshold of not being able to bear it anymore and needing to be at the cusp of some sort of action. And I don't know what that is. And that's uncomfortable to sit with. Um, so that's my, that's where I'm, what I'm sitting with right now in terms of reflecting and sitting with the idea of sila and moral injury and um yeah thank you for that thank you thank you jill that, that's a really good case the the moral injury that we all that so many of us feel about um being witness to gun violence and you know, i i 
do a lot of political action. And, and one of my, this is not a, a Dharma mantra, but this is, you know, I always say, no act is too small. No act is too small. So if it's you know writing um, to a legislator, that, that feeling, talking to other people, seeing what organizations are out there. I mean, you know, that when we when we are feeling that um, that feeling of helplessness is really debilitating and can make us want to become more self-protective because it is such a totally crappy feeling to feel so helpless. So anything we can do um, is uh, is something that um, that really um, I think buffers us against that that sense of, of helplessness. And so I I say no, no act is too small. So start with what is what is small, and um, and notice. And notice how much better you feel. Like once you've sent that that off, and then that might get you to think about the next thing. Is there an organization that you could um, support? Is there someone? I mean, you, you just never know where this is going to to lead to. But that was a wonderful example, Jill. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Other other thoughts and comments. Jill said exactly what I was thinking tonight. I was watching the news and I just thought, do I need to stop watching the news? No. Well, I want to be informed, but I don't want to be traumatized. And so where is that line where we're taking care of ourselves, but we're still informed? Um, and I'm sure we all have different tolerance levels, but for me, it's it's been very traumatic lately, every morning it's the same story over and over. And um, at what point is it okay to protect yourself? Not being in denial, but just truly, purely self-protection and self-care. That's hard. That's a hard one for me. Amy, I think about that sort of as, um, as kind of balancing. So, um, you know, you hear the news, you, um, you know, and it may be, you know, the way you, the way you get the news, whether you listen to it on the radio, whether you, you know, read it in, in print, whether you, you watch it visually. I mean, sometimes people kind of titer themselves and say, well, I'll only, I'll limit myself to, to print. I don't want to see the visuals. I want to know it, but I just want to, I'll just want print or public radio or something. But the other thing I think about is to to really try to balance when we're feeling that helplessness that like really turn toward the good. So what are what's inspiring? Who's doing great stuff? What's a, a, a or going out into nature sometimes? Um, but it, it's really I, I think sometimes we talk about self protection we tend to shut down as opposed to self-care, which is really infusing our lives with the, with what is good, with what is joyful, with what inspires us in, in some ways. And I mean, so like, I often think about when I'm feeling, um, you know, like futile and what, like I think about Jane Goodall who says, um, you know, she says, I'm, I was 86 or 87, she said, yeah, I don't have a lot of time left. I really need to get on the stick and do things. Or, you know, Joanna Macy, who is now 93, and she said, if I could be born at any period of my life, I would at any period in history, any period in history, so if I could choose to be born, I would choose to be born now because it is so dire. This is when people really need to show up. I'm like, I'm just blown away by that like choosing to be born right now because it is is such a a time of of crisis and people really need to show up and so that really i don't feel bad because i'm not a joanna macy i just think okay a human being can have that aspiration so i can move forward you know so it's it's i would just um 
encourage you to, you know, bring your mindful attention to what is skillful in your own circumstance for how to, to balance all that. Does that make sense? Yes. So I went for a walk in the woods today. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. I just needed to connect with nature. That's, that was what my gut told me to do. And that's what I went and did. <laughs> and that is really restorative, I think, for, for a lot of us to, um, you know, to be around trees that have lived a lot longer than any of us have. Um, and to also, when we're in nature, I think what often comes up is how much we care. You know, we're in some place beautiful, we feel nurtured, we feel nourished, and we care. I know, and for me, for those of you who've heard me say this, some of you have heard, heard me say this many times, I think the most important thing about our species is that we are a caring species, you know, none of us would be here if someone, someone or ones hadn't cared enough about us to keep us alive. That is the most important thing. I mean, there are other, especially mammals who, who care, but, you know, we have sort of uh, really, um, that's what our, our forte is. No, that's, that's what we do best as human beings is we really care and we can care about other species, we can care about our world. <clears throat> I, and I think that that's what we, you know, nature reminds us how much we care. And that is really wholesome. Hey, Robert. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This is an issue um, that came up for me in the last week, week and a half, <clears throat> following one of these mass shootings. Um, <clears throat> I was at the University of Minnesota for a dental appointment and um, I was leaving on the elevator and I was on the elevator with about three people and the elevator came down to the first level <clears throat> but I needed the tunnel level, which is one below. And um, I was left on the elevator with one person, a woman who was Asian, uh, probably a student, could have been a faculty, but I thought a student. And uh, as, soon as, the, as soon as she and I were the only two on the elevator, she turned to me, aren't you getting off? And I said, uh, no, I go down to level, tunnel level, because I go that way. And then after I stepped off the elevator, I realized that the anxiety in her voice was that she was alone with me on the elevator and she may have felt uh, I, I i i'm not quite sure what she may have felt but it occurred to me when i got off that i i did the right thing by simply saying no 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 i have to go down one more level because that's the parking level and i wasn't angry or anything like that i said as i would say to anyone <clears throat> But as soon as I stepped off the elevator, I realized <clears throat> the anxiety in her voice was about her being left alone on the elevator with me. And <clears throat> I think I tend to try to meet situations uh, uh, where I feel someone is uncomfortable with some way of being a little more comfort comfortable. I'll speak because when I speak, I think a lot of people uh, may realize I'm not um, up to no good or something like that. But this occurs to me relatively often, I have to say, and it's unfortunate, but this is our time. And I'm, I, I'm glad that I am more receptive to being open to being, uh, to engaging instead of uh, feeling angry and upset and not engaging. So, thank you. Oh, thanks, Robert. I mean, that sounds like a very, um, compassionate response and someone else might have been um, been angry or or irritated by it um, but it seems like you were able to um, to have compassion for her vulnerability and her anxiety 
and that seems to me to be and that you spoke to her in that way that very um, compassionate and skillful response and i'm sorry that that happens to you as as often as it as it does there's a um a book by i think claude Steele that talks about it's called whistling vivaldi and i'm now blanking on the name of the um black journalist who talked about when he was a student at the university of chicago a uh, graduate student at the university of chicago and he'd walk around hyde park that every people would often see him white people and they would cross the street and um and so this happened over and over again that he was a young black male and people just always crossed the street and um he he decided to cope with that by whistling vivaldi when he walked and when he whistled vivaldi people stayed in the street and they smiled and you know that that and, and it's about code switching that he he decided he wanted to code switch and um you know sort of make the white people less anxious i mean he liked vivaldi but it was um it was just a very, and it was self-protective in a way. I mean, that's the other other thing. Given given his circumstances where he as, although the white people may have seen themselves as vulnerable, that he as a black man in Chicago with all, a lot of us know about the Chicago police that, you know, he was the vulnerable person and he dealt with his vulnerability by, um, whistling Vivaldi and um, very, very um, poignant and complex example. Other thoughts? We've got a few minutes left. I have another example, mm -hmm. um, which I'll use the time to say. I was travel. I was driving in my car along uh, 38th Street, uh, going from east to west, and I saw ahead of me that uh, a black man standing at the bus stop at uh, Minnehaha and uh, 38th had stepped off the curb and was annoying or swinging his hand at uh, two men who were riding their bicycle <clears throat> with baby carts behind them. And there, I didn't think there were baby carts, anyone in the carts, but I didn't know why he was doing this. Then I perceived that he was staggering a bit. And I don't suggest anybody try this, but um, it was my decision. I rode up, uh, the two guys on the bicycle, the light changed and they left. And he was there. So I rode up next to him and I said, how are you doing? And he was surprised. He said, okay. I asked him, where are you, where are you going? I didn't perceive any problem with him. But I, what, I, what came to my mind was that he's at 38th and Minnehaha. He's annoying somebody, whether it's justified or not. It doesn't look good to me. And I'd like to see him removed out of this situation. So offered him a lift. And of course, he didn't expect that at all. Uh, he got in the car and he was going north, but then he changed his mind and stayed further south Minneapolis. But I took him to where he wanted to go. And I mean, he really sobered up because no one probably ever did that before. But I felt safe enough to be able to, to uh, encounter the situation in a way that I thought I could deal with it and give him a lift to where he needed to go instead of leaving him there um, high, I think, on drugs or alcohol. I don't know for sure, but uh, it just was a situation like when I looked ahead, I could think this is not a good situation. If he's stepping off the curb, swinging at some people, uh, you know, on their bicycles, something's wrong here. Let me get him out of here before he, and I, and I didn't think it quite that way. I just said, 
I can do something here. And, and I took him where he needs to go. By the time we got where he wanted to go, he had sobered up quite a bit. So, but I don't suggest people try doing that. I've done this a number of different times without a problem. Robert, both of your examples reminded me of um, the time that I sat with Ruth King and she, I think she, it was, she was the one who taught me that like the, that healing happens within a four foot radius. So like you're you next to the elevator, like taking something and maybe transforming it or, you know, like we can, the change we can make is often within a four foot radius. And because that's in an interpersonal connective way. And um, yeah, I really thank you for sharing those examples. And Oh, that is, I, I haven't heard Ruth say that. So I will really take that to heart, Jill. Thank you. That, that's, that's brilliant, of course. Truth is brilliant. So, um, well, thank you, thank you all for being here tonight, and um, I'll just um, share the merit. So, this is my favorite act of sort of imaginative generosity. We can just, you know, be as extravagant as we as we want. Um, so, if there's any goodness to our practice tonight, any merit, any blessing we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would share any blessings with our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends, our community. We would share any goodness with the people we like and the people we don't like so much. We would share any merit with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any goodness, any blessing with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the slimy, the scaly, and the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. <laughs>